All right, so now it's time for some constructive use of pairings. So we've already seen pairings as a kind of attack tool. Well, it transfers the discrete log problem and it makes the decisional de Hamann problem easy in the special case that the first group G1 is equal to G2. Now, here we're going to look into some of the first uh, constructive applications of pairings. So the first one was Antoine Ju at N6000, where he said, hey, well, um, if you ever felt like you're three friends and you want to do a computation like Diffie Hellman, but you don't want to do it with two rounds of communication, um, here's a way how you could do this with pairings. Okay, so let's take P and P prime, which are the generators of G1 and G2. So well, both of these are groups of order L, so anything ex except the neutral element is a generator, but we specify P and P prime. And then each of those Alice, Bob, and Charlie is picking their secret key. Now let's look at what Alice was doing. So this is Alice's perspective, and then Bob and Charlie do their similar thing. So Alice computes scalar multiplication in G1 and the scalar multiplication in G2. So she sends AP and AP prime. And so does Bob, and so does Charlie. And then whenever they get the, mess, uh, the points from the other parties, so Alice from Bob's pair of the public keys, she's only taking BP, and from Charlie, she's taking CP prime. And then she's taking them, she pairs them together, and that result she takes to the power of A. And let's take this as her key, or you can run a key derivation function on top of this. Now, the important thing is that if Alice, Bob, and Charlie all do that with the roles exchanged, so Bob does this pairing not with, well, he knows the B, so he does this with Alice's contribution, Charlie's contribution, and this his P, B on the outside, and for Charlie it's a C on the outside, and Alice's and Bob's parts inside. And then all I claim that all three of those are given the same numbers. So a pairing takes from these components and takes, well, whatever is on the first argument, the scalar can go on the exponent, the second argument can go on the exponent, and from the exponent it can go into any of the places. So, okay, this one gets a times b times c in the exponent, which is what I'm writing here, and similarly this one gets a, b, p, uh, a, b, c, and this one gets a, b, c in the exponent. If you're looking at this one, it's a mind of of optimization, like how could you speed this up or how it can make it simpler, then you could say, hey, actually, I'm only using um, AP, I'm not using AP prime, and only using CP prime, not using CP. So Alice and Charlie could have saved some effort, and well, who's the Bob? So only Bob has to do uh, two computations. So Bob has to do B times P and B times P prime. So if they would have determined before who's the Bob, then they know the party who has to do both computations, but this also means they need an external of communication. The charm of uh, Jus protocol is actually that you only need one round. So, well, if you only have one round, then everybody does a bit more work, and then each party can decide which one to take as P and which one to take as P prime. Now, if it happens so that your G1 equals G2, or if you have some maps between those, then of course you can save some effort and you're only sending uh, the points on the first group. Now the second um, example I want to give you is a little bit more involved in that I have to first say that it's not necessarily the thing that you might want to have. So ID-based cryptography is an idea that goes back to Adi Shamir where you say, okay, um, how about users who are not in the system, but you do want to send them a message. You want to send an encrypted message to this this user. Or you want to enforce um, that Alice picks a fresh key. I mean, you kind of don't trust her. Alice has been using her yahoo.com email address and probably your, her key is that old. It's a key from the early 90s and she never added a password to it. And so you're a little bit concerned and so you want to ensure that for your super important message she gets a fresh key. And then ID-based cryptography allows you to choose a public key for Alice. Typical application would be that you're picking her email address and then using that as her public key or a function derived from that email address. But you could also see, well, I want to have a fresh key for her and so you're taking the email address and the date. Now this can only work if there's some way that for this public key she can get the private key. 
And that's where a trusted authority comes in. And in crypto, we normally have some really queasy feelings about trusted authorities. And this one is a very, very trusted authority. I mean, this is a trusted authority which is able to compute secret keys for public keys. So, of course, it's nice if they give you your secret key, but whenever they would be interested in the contents of your message, well, they can compute that secret key themselves. Now, depending on the regime you're in, this might be exactly what they want to have. Some security for you against your neighbor, but no security from you for you from the government. Or maybe more reasonably, or at least more justifiable, would be a company system where you have something where, well, you can't, you must not use it for private messages, and your messages must be recoverable by the company. Say, if you leave, or if you get hit by a bus, or something else happens, that they need to get your keys anyway. In that case, well, if they compute your secret keys and that way get it, it's maybe not so much worse. This is not a system you want to use for your normal security. Normal security is the user generates the private key and the public key and nobody else has them. But if you want an ID-based system, it was actually an open problem for 20 years, more than, and to come up with something which enables this. And so in the early 2000s, after Zhu's paper, so there was a, a group of Japanese authors which had the idea of doing ID-based key exchange. And then Bonnie and Franklin got a lot of attention for a paper at Cryptography in, 2000, in crypto in 2001, where they well, presented the version that I'm showing you here. So this is the first instantiation that we have for ID-based cryptography, and it uses pairings, unsurprisingly, for this lecture. So let's assume that we have a hash function that maps into G2. So it takes strings and maps two points on the elliptic curve. And then the master secret key of the trusted authority, that's a normal uh, discrete log key in the first group. So P is again an element in G1. And while well, we don't need any G, uh, P prime, that will be normally an element of G2. So the public key of the TA is S times P, and S is the secret key. And this secret key will allow the TA to um, generate secret keys for all users. Now the encryption starts by picking the public key of the user. So taking again our alice at example.com or alice at yahoo.com and then you hash this getting a point in G2. So that's this H uh, which gives a point in G2 and this is now one of these pairing inputs. And the other part is a random choice you're taking. We have seen this in Algamal encryption, we have seen this in Tiffy Hellman, so you're picking a nonce K and you're computing R times P, uh, K times P, and calling it R. Now the encryption, let's look at the ingredients. The encryption is taking the public key of the TA, is taking the public key of the user you just made, so this is the G1 element, the G2 element, and then raising or computing the pairing and raising this to the kth power. Then we throw a KDF at it, so now we have a bit string, and then we XOR it with a message. And of course, at this moment, instead of XOR, you could, you could also use the AS encryption under that key or AS GCM under that key. Important thing is you're sending a ciphertext, which is doing something with a message under this key here. And you also need to send R. So this is like a normal algorithm, you're sending this R1. And then the decryption starts with first obtaining your private key from the TA. And this is a bit of an unusual thing here. The private key, which normally is a scalar, like for the TA itself, here it's another element in G2. And it's the S times the public key here. So your public key is age of ID, your private key is um, age of ID, and your private key is S times age of ID. And this only the TA can compute for you because they know S. And then the to decrypt, you're computing the pairing with this private key you just obtained in the second argument and the R from the message here in the first argument. Compute the KDF of that and X always C. Well, we would like that uh, M prime is M, so let's look why that's the case. So let's look at if we compute the pairing of, e, uh, of R with S prime, then, well, R is K times P and S prime is S times H of ID. 
Well, in a pairing, you can always take the scalars and put them in the exponent. So that's what happens in this step. And then we take one of the exponents, namely the s, and move it to the first argument. Ah, and this is s times p is the public key of the TA, h of id is matching, and then the k is also matching. Okay, so whatever goes into the KDF is the same, and so also the m prime, which is the KDF plus c, well, is the KDF that was used in computing c, and then you have just this KDF x always itself, so out comes m. So when are these systems secure? Well, first of all, we require that the discrete log problem is hard in those groups. And then there are also the matching problems for the, well, we have seen the Diffie-Hellman problem, computational and decisional, and now here we have the bilinear versions of this. So this is the computational bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem and the decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem. And as you have seen in this Mal, even though it looks like, well, you have to solve the DLP or at least the computational Diffie-Hellman problem, the indistinguishability that is our normal security requirement, that is only equivalent to the decisional problem. And the same holds here with this, um, now, with the ID-based encryption. And then the problems themselves is really just the analogon to the, uh, by, uh, to the normal Diffie-Hellman, so you give the computational one as you want to compute, a tripartite key given the inputs that Eve sees, and then decisional is you give them a target um, RP and you want to decide whether that matches A, B, C, P if you're giving all the things that you would see in public. Before I can show you the last application that I want to do, I have to introduce one more thing for parents, namely a distortion mapper. This is another of those things which don't always exist. But if you have a map from G1 to G2 that is compatible with the group operation, so it's homomorphism, and it's injective. Well, okay, it just means it's not a constant map. It doesn't map everybody just to the neutral element. So if you have such a distortion map, well, then you basically can state your protocol with G1 times G1, because for the second element, you before you apply your pairing, you just map it to G2. So the the math part, the pairing, the Tate and Vale pairing, they need G1 and G2, but you have this distortion map which takes you from G1 to G2, and so, well, you can give the interface to the protocol designer of G1 here, and for the mathematician, well, you apply phi. Of course, it needs to be efficient in order to be able to do this. So, the, for instance, the tripartite Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you only need one key, only AP, not AP and IP prime, or in the uh, ID-based cryptography, some of the complications disappear as well. And often the computation in G1 are a lot cheaper than in G2. So you can also save some computation time by doing your computations in G1 and then just mapping them over to G2 using this distortion map. And the application I want to show you is um, very short signatures. And I mean, we have seen short signatures, we have seen um, at DSA, we have seen ECDSA, and we have seen DSA, which is, well, attempted to get as short as ECDSA, but these are actually shorter. So um, a negative consequence is that the decision to the Hellman problem is broken, because this is exactly the situation that I showed you in the case of the first lecture in pairings, that we're having that G1 equals G2, and if this is an injective map, we have that the pairing of E with E prime, sorry, but E with itself is not one. Of course, this is the pairing prime. It's the pairing where we kind of pop the second point through phi. So it's a nice thing if you're the protocol designer and you want to have an easier interface. It is not so great if you also relied on the decision to have a problem with G1. So you can't have those things. But the BLS signature system um, is able to achieve some short signatures which we don't have otherwise. So we need a distortion map, and we need to have, uh, I mean, I'm just writing it with g1 equals g2, and we're needing a hash function that maps into g1. So this hash function is similar to the ID-based system, except for, well, now writing it with g1 there. 
then well it's a signature so we have our normal key generation signature and verify step and so for the key generation as always you're picking your secret key you're picking your Alice secret key A oops <laughs> I, I changed the notation that this should be A times P and so this is your public key A is your private key and then to sign a message you have very few steps it's just one scan of application so you're computing the hash of your message that gives you a point and you're computing A times this point Well, assume that the discrete log problem is hard, everybody can compute the hash of the message, but they wouldn't be able to get the A from it. So only you are able to do this. But how is Bob going to verify this? Well, that's where the parents come in. And so what Bob is taking is your public key Q as a first argument and the message that you claim to have signed here with the hash function. And then Bob accepts this if this pairing is the same as the pairing of P with S. Well, this is the signature you have. And again, well, you can kind of trace this through in your head. The Q has the AP and the A is in the S here. So, yes, if its signature is signed validly, then we have either the A here or there. And, well, the feature of pairings that you can move the scalars around by that feature these two should be the same. So a valid, a honestly generated signature is accepted. And you can compress the point. So I mean, what, what you're sending as your signature is just one point. And so if you're thinking of, say, um, at D is A, you're sending a point and this integer mod L. And actually there I should have also highlighted that we always just send the point by one coordinate and a bit. And so similarly here, you're compressing this point down to just one coordinate and assign it. So if it's a Edwards curve, you're sending just the y coordinate. If it's a Montgomery curve, you're sending the x coordinate. And then you're sending one bit in order to identify where it was plus s or minus s. So this is one element of size. Well, p, well, p is about the same as l. So that's half the length of the easy DSA or add DSA. So these are even shorter than what we have as elliptic curve signatures. And if you compare this to what you would be getting with um, RSA signatures, of course, these are really, really short. So this was the, the happy news about pairings. Of course, you don't know yet whether you can instantiate it and so on, but at least you have seen how this could possibly be useful.